Kelly Keene has just released a new book and I've got some questions that I'm going to ask her starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. I don't need to introduce my next guest. Everyone knows who she is. She ran her own wealth management firm for many years and she sold it to become a personal finance educator. She's the personal finance educator on CTV's The Marilyn Dennis Show and she's on radio and TV all the time and she writes lots of articles. She was a guest on episode number 75 back in February 2016. So here we are, three years later, she's back, where we talked about her ninth book. Today, she's back to talk about her just-released book number 10. Kelly Keene, welcome back to Debt Free in 30. I can't be able to believe it's been so long, Three Dad. years, only three Too years. Too long. Too now, long. I'm not sure, is, is this book number 10? I know when you were on last time, you told me that there was a book you had written that never actually got published. Yes, so, so I've written 10, 9 got published. Nine. Okay, so yes. and is this number 9 then, or is this number 10? So that's or? number 9 published, published. number okay. 10. And right. we're never going to get to see that no, secret book. It's been not. buried. and, and we're that's, not. It that's, just timed out. That's too bad. That's yeah. too bad. So, All right. Um, okay, so this book is called Talk Money to Me. Yeah. Save well, spend some, and feel good about your money. So give us the big picture. What is this book about? This book is about everything you need to know about uh, debit, about credit, uh, debt, uh, investing, really the basics. And then through a lens of these characters, there's 10 characters in the book in each chapter, what they've done wrong, the missteps that, you know, I want them to know, and then the happy ending at the end. But the big, big takeaway is about Canadians feeling good about money, because if you don't even feel that picking up a book or making a call to someone like you or another professional, you're not going to do anything. You're going to bury your head. And apathy is the worst thing we can do when it comes to our finances. So you're kind of trying to do a little bit of a jump start here. Yeah. To get, and so who is this book targeted towards? Is it, I mean, I, I've read it and I think it's, well, pretty much everybody, but pretty is much. there, there is there any specific person or no, if you're alive, then you should read this book. Yeah. There's going to be something for everyone in the book. I mean, obviously um, it's, it's pretty much targeted at more of a millennial kind mm -hmm. of audience that maybe they haven't bought their first home yet. They want to understand how to negotiate a mortgage rate or increase their credit or what have you. But I mean, we talk about beneficiaries, we talk about what to do when your parents are aging, um, how to even look at your time and what it's worth, just all these money missteps mm -hmm. that um, I just didn't feel was covered in a book and my publisher didn't. So here yeah, it is. Here, here it, it is. is. Well, and and I like the the uh, endorsement from David Shelton. Everyone knows him, the, the wealthy barber, good Kitchener guy. Kelly gets it. She's clear and clever. Best endorsement. I told my kids to read this book. And so... When I read that, I thought, okay, well, yeah, that's okay. But then when you read it, it's like, yeah, you know what? That's exactly what you should do. Give this to your kids yeah. if your kids are, you know, 20 years old, 30 yeah. years old, and this would be this would be perfect for them. So so David nailed it on that one. He should write a book or something. I, so you would think what, he's what, very... Should, he's, next he's, time you see him, tell he's him. He's wonderful. That. Make sure you read all the Wealthy Barber, the, the two of well, them. Well, and I understand great. he's working on another one. So oh. that's what, that's what uh, Twitter says. Yeah. So if it's on that's Twitter, you know it's true. Okay, so I'm going to read you two quotes, mm -hmm. and I want you to comment on them. These are from the book, Talk Money to Me, okay? So, and then I want you to read a quote. So here's the, the first quote, and this is from the introduction. I'm not going to give away all the good stuff. Okay. We're just going to do in the introduction here. People Perfect. have to buy the book to find the rest. <laughs> I saw firsthand, so this is you talking, I saw firsthand that people make poor decisions when they don't have access to all that they need to survive and thrive in the world. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is, so it took a long time, oddly enough, for me to come up with my mission, if you go on my website, for Canadians to feel good about money. And then I received kind of a lot of questions and criticism about that. Like, what does that mean? Uh, and it's not about your money. It's about money. Because I'm not presupposing that mm. someone actually has money. Uh, so that was very important that it was it was specific. So the why behind my why is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, and I'm sure your listeners and viewers all are familiar that a lot of the population is at the bottom, just looking after food and housing, making sure that their bills are paid, that their, their lights don't get shut off, that they can feed their kids. And that's what I grew up with. I grew up with a single mom raising three kids, my brothers and I, on zero education, waitressing to, to get us through. But the, the thing was that um, I had very wealthy uncles. So anyway, that's that's the reason why I've written a lot of books about money because I pretty mm -hmm. was pretty messed up about money. But what I watched growing up was... Um, you know, people that didn't have money 
Um, and not firsthand always, but I, I think that we're not, I know we're not our best selves. You're not the best parent you could be. You're not the best employer, employee. You're not the best citizen of our country. And people turn to things that they may not turn to, um, like government assistance, crime, drugs, whatever, if they had money. Because I watched my wealthy uncles mm -hmm. and how they talked, how they walked, how they negotiated. And it was very, very different. So I think that we're all good people with um, opportunities to be even better, but that lack of money does not allow you to be better. Yeah. And I mean, I see that here all the time and you're right. It's, and, and that, that messes with our minds mm. then. So this becomes a self-worth thing then, doesn't it? Absolutely. And so- yeah. How, so how is that then that, you know, I don't have money, so I'm a bad person? Yeah. So, I mean, we we all like participation's making a big resurgence the last few years. Oh, yeah. Like, it. it's huge. It's like... It's the 1970s. Right? Oh, I remember yeah, having yeah. the badges and everything yeah. of that sort. And there was a time we used to whisper the word cancer, right? It was shameful. It was awful. And today we run for the cure. There's Facebook support groups. There's like everything. You would never suffer through a cancer diagnosis on your own. It's you're not a bad person because you, you you had something happen to you physically. And the thing too, you can't fix health. You can be the healthiest person in the world. There's going to be times in your life when crap happens, right? Mm -hmm. That's just a reality. So why is it that number one, we're, we have no foundation in our school system when it comes to money, about checking your credit, about not you know um, overspending or going bankrupt or saving or whatever. We have no we have no foundation that we come out with. And then we expect that we have to be successful. When, and now with the younger generations and really everyone dealing with Instagram and, and false mm -hmm. appearances yep. um, and, and, and trying to – and you know more than anyone, you and a banker and when I was in my banking days, that, it, you know, there's only – there's like you and God know what you earn and the bankruptcy trustee and yeah, the banker. Yeah, that's it. Like, yeah. that's it. And everyone else, you can appear to be super wealthy and doing all of that. So – we have to separate self-worth and net worth, that they're very different things. Because if your self-worth is tied up in your net worth and something happens, maybe you're a business owner and uh, your, your, your assistant embezzles from you or something of that sort, you're not going to make that call to someone like you, Doug, to someone like a certified financial planner, to someone else, a professional in the industry with the, with the right credentials and qualifications, because you're not going to have the self-esteem to do it because you feel like a failure. Yeah. Right? So you're not going to take any action and then you're going to wait till it's really bad. And it could have been a lot better if you had the self-esteem to be like, hey, something happened to me financially. I'm going to find the right pro for me and ask the right questions. Yeah. And if you if your self-worth is tied up in your job and you get laid off, oh, exactly. then you're, you're kind of pooch. And I agree with you. You are not your job. You are not your bank balance. That's a, that's a, a key point. Now, this ties into the next quote I want to read. Still in the introduction here. A lot of good stuff just in the first three pages here. <laughs> Again, this is you talking. So in the last 15 years as a personal financial, finance educator, the number one question I get asked is, how is everyone making it? Mm. Well, that's what you were just alluding mm. to. Well, I'm here to tell you that they probably aren't making it. So we've all, you know, we see the studies all the time that people are living paycheck to paycheck. They're just close to, you know, being in a, mm. in a serious problem. So what are your comments on that? How does the book address that particular uh, issue. Well, we talk about it a lot. And in the characters and in the chapters, we look at exactly the examples of them either spending too much to keep up appearances. I, I, I've i certainly had to do it myself. Like it's really challenging. And it doesn't matter where you are on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you're right at the bottom, you still don't know how all your friends are making it. Mm -hmm. If you're like, I've got a couple friends that are billionaires, right? Then you just start to compare yourself differently. Yep. But you can't, and it's interesting, and you probably know this study, there was um, a University of Alberta professor, and I think it was an Israeli professor, and they wanted to quantify the keeping up with the Joneses effect. And they looked at lottery uh -huh. winners, right? Yep. And shockingly enough, um, if, you're, if your neighbor wins the lottery, your chance of going bankrupt 
for every thousand dollars they win increases by 2.4 percent and it's and you go so i tell people this and readers this and they were like what what how is that possible mirror neurons we have something in our brain called a mirror neuron so dr rizzolotti um who was a researcher that hooked up a bunch of probes to monkeys uh, this is important and he um one of the researchers was licking an ice cream cone and a monkey was watching him and his brain lit up as if he, the monkey, was licking the ice cream cone from just watching someone. And this is why we love sports. This is why we watch these things because a part of us scored that goal. Yep. A part of us got that shot when the Raptors, like, whatever, right? That yeah. like That's us. So when your neighbor comes home with that great new car that you really want, or your coworker comes in with the fancy suit or whatever it is that you want, your mirror neuron lights up. And you now want to go and spend that money and live up yeah, with them. Because you're comparing yourself to them. Yeah. You're not – the only person you should compare yourself to is, you know, you yesterday. Right. Not your friend today. Right. And you're absolutely right. And you did talk about that in the book that, uh, yeah, your friend wins the lottery, your next door neighbor wins the lottery. Now all of a sudden, boy, I feel poor. Exactly. So I better go and, and spend a lot of money. And you've got some good stories in here. I mean, you you tell your car story, which people can read the book to uh, – to uh, to find out more about. Now, I want you to read a quote here because okay. again, this kind of flows through and I've, I get asked all the time. So like, what's going on? Why are, why yeah. are we in such trouble? What's, uh, what's happening? And so you actually have, you know, a theory on that. So uh, here we go. Hopefully the, the lights are good enough so that you can see that. So Perfect. I would like you to read the paragraph from, uh, from the book, and we'll uh, we'll talk about it. Okay, and you've read the book, so thank I've you. Read I, I've read so it. I appreciate that. The car it. story, you got that. Yeah. So it says, you may have heard that incentives drive the market, but right now, I'd argue that very low interest rates are driving the market, and with low interest rates comes high levels of debt. To add to that, housing prices have soared because borrowing money is relatively cheap and people have easy access to lines of credit. And with a line of credit, you can make interest-only payments and have that debt stay with you forever. It's cheap money. Why not indulge? I know I hear that all the Mm -hmm. time from people. And therein lies the problem. We're encouraged to spend more and more and use borrowed money to do it. It's good for the economy. It's good for politicians. It's good for the bank and stockholders. But spoiler alert, it is not good for you. Ouch. And I totally agree with everything you just said there. So uh, have you done an audio version of this? Because I, no, I can give you that yet. one paragraph and then you just have to just have <laughs> to do all the rest. There, I'll talk to my publisher. That's right. We're already on it. So very interesting comment there. So money is cheap. So why not? Yep. And it's been cheap for years and years and years oh. and years. And so if you're under the age of, I don't know, 35, you don't remember, maybe under the age of 45, you don't remember what a double digit mortgage yeah. is. Because it's just never been a thing. And so, yeah, if I need money, why don't I just borrow it? And you hit the nail on the head. It's great for, um, you know, the economy, bankers, politicians, because we all feel Mm -hmm. good, right? So we keep voting for the guy, you know, the bank stockholders, but it's not good for you. And, you know, why is it not good for you? Are you just burying yourself in debt then? Is that the whole problem? Yeah, and the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada actually had a warning, I believe it was a couple of years ago, for Canadians to stop using their house as an ATM, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So there's these readvanceable mortgages where the bank is like, hey, why don't we have a line of credit for you uh, in addition to your mortgage? And you're like, yeah, sure, why not? And there's there's some times that that's a prudent strategy, right? Um, we know that you're supposed to have three to six months emergency savings in a safe account. Well, why would you have that sitting there? I got my house, earning I can nothing borrow or, against it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you've got this line of credit in case you need it. But the problem is, is instead of us saying no, instead of us saying I can't afford it, instead of us saying I'm not going to keep up with the Joneses, we give the kids everything they want. We give ourselves everything we want. Uh, You know, people are ticking off their bucket list at 30, right? It's no longer a bucket Mm, list. It's like I want to do everything list now. And I get it. I get it. This is human nature. But what happens with those mortgages is as you make a mortgage payment, your line of credit increases, right? So there's this temptation where you keep, and it's like, well, it's only $150 a month to service your, I don't know, 50 Billion or- dollars with low interest. Thousand, yeah, yep. exactly. But the problem is, is people aren't paying that off. And I don't have the stats right in my head, but it was alarming how much lines of credit have increased, how many people are making interest-only payments and don't get that that means you're going to retire with that debt. 
Yeah. And so long as house prices keep going up by 20% a year, it's all good, right? Right. But of course, again, anybody who was alive in like 1989, 1987, 88 will remember that house prices mm-hmm. can mm-hmm. actually go down. Anybody who's lived in Alberta mm-hmm. in the last few years. Boy, what a flood. Like, and that happened in the blink yep. of an eye. It was eye. fast. So, I mean, Fort McMurray, search oh. it on the internet there. I mean, that uh, that was, you know, devastation. When right. Oil prices went down all of a sudden we're moving out of the oil patch and boom yeah. so it's one thing when you've got this asset that keeps going up in value and you're borrowing against it i mean i agree with you it's bad because your debt payments are going up but when that asset starts to decline in value and you don't have exactly. anything to borrow against then you're then you're pooched so your advice to people then is what well, and even Doug, I mean, even if it kept going up, theoretically, you're going to want to retire one day and you're not going to want to keep taking new debt out mm-hmm. to fund the old debt just to keep afloat. So, I mean, the advice is, is and, and we go through it in depth, is like really looking at your situation and getting honest, getting on an online calculator, talking to a professional as soon as the red flags start to pop up, right? That this debt is getting uncomfortable, unmanageable, you're getting closer to retirement, or you don't have the emergency savings. Um, like it really depends on where a person's situation is. And you know more mm-hmm. than anyone, there's no cookie cutter situation anymore, right? No, I agree. And the first step is like spend five minutes thinking about it. Right. Because we don't even spend five minutes Isn't thinking about it. Truth? Like actually get a piece of paper or a spreadsheet if you're like a smart guy. And you can write it down. Here's how much my debt is. It's going to keep increasing when I retire and my income goes down, Mm -hmm. but my debt payments go down, then what's going to happen to me? Well, I I got a problem. That's certainly something we walk people through. Now, you were talking about CFPs, Mm -hmm. um, which stands for- Certified Financial Planner. Certified Financial Planner. We've had a number of them on the show, Sandy Martin, Rona Birnbaum, Jason Heath. I'm probably um, missing one or two others, so sorry. I forgot off the top of my head that, that you've been on. And- In a lot of cases, certainly those three people I just mentioned, I believe, are fee-only financial planners. Yep. Which means you go to them, you pay them for their advice, and they don't have any vested interest in whether or not you buy that particular mutual fund. Right. Or Uh, any investment at all, or life insurance, or anything. that They're not licensed to sell products. Now, a, a financial planner is just a word. Am I Mm -hmm. correct on that? Mm Mm-hmm. I could call myself a financial planner. Yes. And I believe the rules are different in Quebec than the rest of the country. But, right. But, you know, it, it's, it's you know, I could call myself expert. Well, that, that's just a exactly. word too. Whereas CFP is an actual real thing. You got to write exams. It takes a number of years, the whole bit. Absolutely. So if you're getting advice, find out who it is you're 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 talking to. If they have CFP at the end of their name, okay, they've actually gone through some education. Exactly. There's some ethical components. And yep. it's the same thing with a, you know, CPA, a licensed insolvency exactly. trustee, whatever. You want to kind of know who you're talking to. So, and then you still want the right one for you. But yeah, the first step is making sure they're legitimate, yeah. right? They have somebody overseeing, they're, they're being regulated, all of that. And then what's right for you? Because back to the quote you read, the person who is at the bank selling you the thing mm-hmm. might not actually be acting in your best interest. Could actually be the case, right? right. So, okay, now, a couple more questions for you. You... Um, if I'm reading your book correctly, are not a huge fan of budgeting (laughs) and neither am I. And people can look at all my YouTube videos and I believe I talked about it in my book as well. So give me your position on that. Budgeting is not the solution to all the world's problems is your opinion. So tell me why. Okay, so for people that like budgets, great. Like You're an skip, accountant, yeah, great. Like skip that part of the book. That's fantastic. Yeah. But I think most Canadians don't. We don't like the finger wagging. I know I don't. I don't want to write about the anything. The finger wagging. You know, like here's your budget. I love people that budget. I love their little spreadsheets and I wish I could stick to it. It's just like my brother counts his calories every single day. I don't want to count my calories every single day, but I do count my calories a couple of times a year because I need to know what's going in my body. And sometimes I'm like, wow, I had 
have no idea when mm-hmm. you start paying attention to what's in that latte and then you make a different choice yep. or at least you're aware about it. So all I ask people to do twice a year, make my husband and I do it as well, is what I call my 30-day anti-budget. Mm-hmm. And all you're doing is tracking your spending for 30 days. It's super simple if you bank at one place because if you use one debit card, one credit card, they're going to kind of do that all. But you still have to be a bit of an investigative, like a detective uh, about your finances because I want you to look at your car and auto insurance. I want you to dig into your cell phone bills, into all of that type of stuff. Like just seeing what you're spending, it's like, oh, well, I spent this. Okay, great. What's the interest costing you on your credit card? What's mm-hmm. your student loan you know, interest costing you? Like what? what is it costing you for your life in a 30-day picture? And then usually people are like, oh, like Didn't there's always something. That. Yeah. There's a, and, and, and the message is not about again the finger wagging. It's not about sacrifice. It's about choice and awareness. I can have the glass of wine and the piece of chocolate cake. I can't have them every night together. Yep. Right? It's choice and awareness. Right? Make a note of that. Cannot have the wine and the <laughs> and chocolate. The chocolate. And so I can have one or one the or other, the other. And not... it depends what you ate during the day. <laughs> like right. I mean, we it's 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 common knowledge with our health, but then we forget it when it comes to our money because again, there's the shame and the embarrassment, so we don't do anything. So you do that. You do that exercise. It's a it's a behavioral change exercise. Usually, people are are more aware, um, and it sh- and people in the health um, field have studies have shown that keeping a food uh, diary actually improves people's health. Like just mm-hmm. being mindful of it. Then you times everything by twelve. As soon as you get your categories of where you spent your money, and then you multiply it by twelve for a year, and now you see. Oh, hmm. maybe we did have money for the RSP. Yeah. Maybe we did have money for a vacation, whatever. If we stop this, cut that subscription out, it's it's your money. It's your life. It's yeah, just, a, a do co- you know where it's going? A coffee is two bucks. That's nothing. Right. But if I go on my way to work, morning coffee break, grab one at lunch, afternoon coffee yeah. break on my way home, 300 days a year, okay, now all of a sudden it's real money. And And my objection to budgeting is that in my experience, people just don't do it. Yeah. And I think it would be exactly yeah. the same as calorie counting. I mean, your brother is obviously a superhuman to be able to do mm-hmm. it forever. Um, we'll have to have him on the show next. We'll, <laughs> we'll talk about what his issues are. But it's, you know, I, I, it's, just too, it's just too much too for much. a lot of people. Exactly. And then you get into this, um, you know, I feel really bad because I didn't do it. Mm-hmm. And so now okay, I might as well just eat the whole bag of Oreos mm-hmm. then because you know what, I'm I'm off the wagon. Whereas I like your approach that, okay, every you know a few months, sort of take a step back and yeah. take another snapshot. And that works obviously for, you know, what's how's my exercise routine going? Oh, I exactly. haven't actually been to the gym in, in six months. What am I eating? What am I spending? How's my investments looking? So anybody can do anything for a short period of time. Right, yeah, exactly. And, and so you get the benefit without the... Uh, you know all the the shame of not being able to do it. So so I like that. Okay, we're both on the same page on on budgeting. Nice. Page sixty three. You remember what you said on page sixty three, Kelly? I do not, Doug. Do you remember yeah. what you said no, on your page sixty three? I don't. So I know that I've been interviewed and people have done that to me. So I th- I wanted to make you uncomfortable as well. I'll tell you what you said. You talked about. Uh-huh. You should make your career uh-huh. your fourth asset class. Mm-hmm. Now that is cool. Cool. I think. So what are the first three asset classes? Okay. So generally in the financial industry, when we're talking about an asset class, so an asset is something you think is going to go up Mm -hmm. and there's classifications of their risk and what they're going to bring in. So generally speaking, it's cash, it's bonds or fixed income, same thing, or equity or stocks. Okay. Mm-hmm. You could argue that there's real estate, that there's gold and precious metals. And but, cryptocurrency. And what? cryptocurrency. Let's and, talk about that for three oh hours. Oh my but. gosh. But generally speaking, in the yeah. financial world, those are the three assets. So if you sit down with a financial advisor or planner or somebody looking after your investments, they're going to create this little pie and you're going to have so much in, in and your each broker of those. would certainly understand what those three things Absolutely. are. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But the fourth one the fourth you're saying one, is you should make your career your fourth asset class. Yes. Tell me about that. So there is nothing that is going to earn you more in your lifetime than your career. If you just earned the average income, you and your spouse, you're going to earn millions of dollars in your life. It would behoove us to really pay attention to that. Now, the financial industry also doesn't pay attention to that. So if you're a professor with tenure or you've got a really stable job, you're, you're, you've got a low risk kind of job, you're probably 
low risk with your portfolio as well. Hmm. Probably. Because that's the way your mind is wired. Probably. If you're like me, you're an entrepreneur, you're self-employed, you're kind of a business owner, you're used to taking risks every single day, you probably take want to take more risks with your investments. So those should be the polar opposite, right? Hmm. My big asset is my career and I'm really risky with it. So I better be more safe for me with my investments. Now, if you've got a super safe career, you might want to look at Maybe you should be taking more risks. Now, you want to talk to a qualified professional, but you need to think back to like the Enron days or what have you. You take someone, here's their career, here's their stock options, their benefits, their everything. So when they lost their job, when Enron went out, they lost their entire life. Sears. Sears. They were not diversified. So if you're in the financial industry, Mm -hmm. you might be investing all in the financial industry or whatever, or you're in oil and gas and, and you get caught up in it. So you want to look at your whole life. You want to look at diversity with your spouse, right? So does your spouse have the same kind of career or very different where you're a stock and I'm a bond or vice versa and and have that bigger conversation that the financial industry is just like, well, what pot of money are you bringing and how should we diversify that? That's not enough. That's not enough. If I worked at a big company or the government and I've got a solid pension, I can take more risks because I know that when I retire, there's going to be X number of dollars there every month. But as you say, if I'm an entrepreneur... And my only asset is this company I own. Probably have no... Yeah, exactly. And the the company ends. So as long as the company's doing great, fantastic. Mm -hmm. But the company gets into trouble, you got a problem. So that's good. I like that. Uh, Make uh, your career your fourth asset class. And a lot of the people who come into this office, and we're recording this here in my Toronto office, they've had a problem with their job. They got Mm -hmm. laid off. The company, you know, closed down, whatever, and they expected they would be there forever. Right. And then they weren't. Yeah. And oop, now you're, now you got a problem. So you ask yourself, what would happen if the stock went down? Well, I've got more than one stock in my portfolio. Exactly. But you can't have seven jobs at the same time. Yeah. So being aware of the risks of, you know, what, and ask yourself that question when you're doing your six month review. Right. Right. Okay. So what would happen? If my company closed down tomorrow, well, mm-hmm. do you have a resume that's already fresh? Oh, exactly. No, I haven't looked at it in 20 years. So, and I have this discussion with people all the time. So if you got laid off tomorrow, what's the first call, phone call you'd make? Well, I don't know. Wow. I don't, I don't, you know, well, I guess, I guess what I would do is I'd go to the, the competitor who's in a similar industry where my skills would be transferable. Good idea. Is the, is your resume up to date? Are you a member of whatever the industry Do you have association? Do an article on that? I should, though. I should. You, actually, that would be a really should, good LinkedIn though. article. I would love the, uh, to read that. I'll make, I'll make a, a note. That's really good advice, Doug. Well, and... and um, like, the, really good advice. We do... When you file a bankruptcy or proposal, there's two yeah. credit counseling sessions that are part of it. And the government would like me to focus on the budgeting aspect of that. Mm. And as you and I have just discussed, for some people that's very important, but for other people, maybe things like your job situation is is even more important. Because if you can see a potential problem coming and take steps to solve it in advance, yeah, I've got a side gig that I do. My resume's up to date. I'm taking some classes on the side in case. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I I talked to a lady very recently who was doing exactly that. I think she works in a big insurance company or something. And so I said, okay, what What's the next posting? Well, I could become the assistant manager or whatever, but there's these three courses I need to take. Mm. They cost money, but I don't have to take them all today. I can take them over a year or two. Okay, great. Start taking the first one. So I think that all- That's brilliant because you're right. Like most people don't even realize- I mean, you blink and things are changing so rapidly. Industries yep. are disappearing. Jo- I mean, I have so many friends that are I thought they had their jobs like executives with mm-hmm. really great jobs that now at 55, 60 don't know how to look for a job. And it's hard to reinvent yourself at that point. Now, if you got a million bucks in the bank and no right. debt, great. Let's go to Florida for a few months and yeah. think about it. But when yeah. you're right on the edge, as yes. most people are, then it's a then it's And that's a not when you problem. have the cognitive capacity yep. to be proactive because you're in reactionary mode and you're freaked it's, out. It's too late. So I love your advice about yeah. thinking about that in advance. And that's why your system of every six months I take a step back, right. pour a bottle of wine and do my thinking. Yeah. I don't have that cognitive pressure on me because I'm going to get laid off tomorrow. So it's a lot easier. So since we're doing this uh, podcast on uh, psychology, (laughs) um, and neither one of us have a PhD in that, but we we play one on the podcast, (laughs) what is 
page 91. Uh-huh. You remember that one, the reciprocity rule? Okay. So tell me what is the reciprocity rule and how does that play into our minds? Okay. This is, I think this is really cool, the way this, this actually works. Yeah. So this is from a book called The, Hop- uh, the Happiness Hypothesis, which I absolutely love. Love, love, love that book. And he talks about how this is a hardwired rule in our brain that through evolution, you know, let's say we're part of the tribe. We needed the tribe. We needed the tribe to to survive. And and if Doug had a good kill and and I had some berries over here, Doug can only eat so much. You're talking and about I, animals I've killed. You right, right, right. Okay, exactly. just so we're clear. Here. Animals that you. Okay, you yeah, ki- I assume yeah, you killed yeah, the animal. Maybe you right. picked yeah, the berries and I killed the animal. That's probably what happened. But, <laughs> but so I've it, killed this animal, and and you can only eat so much. It's going to go to waste. So then you would have been like, Hey, Kelly, I got some some animal here left for you. Uh, why don't you give me some? Some of those berries and be like, yeah, sure, my berries are going to... Re-. So uh, it's hardwired, right? That mm-hmm. I give to you, you're going to give back to me and we're going to kind of keep an accounting. Well, apparently that has followed us through um, to even today where something as simple as being handed, um, you know, a glass of or, or a bottle of water at a car dealership when you're shopping mm-hmm. for the car to ingratiate you with the salesperson or whatever other free thing you've been sent in the mail or some gift that another sales person has given you or a gift with purchase or what have you that we feel, we don't think about this consciously, that we feel obligated to now reciprocate with our love, our our money, our our agreement, what have you. So the takeaway, I believe that was the car trap and that was the couple that was going car shopping. Mm-hmm. And the takeaway in that chapter was bring your own water, bring your own snacks for the kids, like, you know, arm yourself when you're making these major financial decisions and don't be, um, you know, don't fall prey to what retailers know yeah. uh, is happening to you, right? Yeah. That free sample at, uh, you've ever been to Costco? Have you ever heard of that oh, store? I've heard of that store. People go just to eat yep. samples yep. there, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. But when I get that little free tiny thing, it's like, well, I might as well buy the bag, right? Mm-hmm. And now maybe it's because I tasted it and it was really great and I really like that and I should. But, but of all the things you could have bought in there, yep. of all the things you could have bought in there, right? Yeah. Or maybe nothing. Like maybe you were coming into Costco, you just wanted to look around, but now they engaged you. Yeah. Yep. And so it's like, well, I kind of feel like I owe them now. Yeah. And But your example with the car dealer is is exactly right. You know, it's uh, here's a coffee, buy a car. Right. And I think every car dealership has free coffee. Of course. Or, or come to a, a wine tasting event. Well, you know, there's something there yeah. that you're going to be sold on. And it's not don't go, but just have the lens of... Hey, my reciprocity rule might kick in here. And just because I go to their free event or take their water, what have you, I don't owe them anything. You just want to have that in your awareness. Yeah, my guard has to be, my spidey sense has to be tingling, I guess, when I walk in there that, okay, I realize they're doing all these things to influence me. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. Mm -hmm. You still got a brain, just be, just be alert to it. So Excellent. Now I got 75 more questions, but we're out of time. So we're going to have to have you back, hopefully not three years from now. That would be wonderful. I would like you to wrap up with with two things. And I kind of like you to kind of put a bow on it because really the the central theme of Talk Money to Me is there is a big difference, as you said, between self-worth and net worth. Mm-hmm. So we already talked about, I think, you know, what, what the what the concept is. Right. And how then do you, in your brain, break that wiring that says, I am my job or I am what's in my bank account? How do you separate your self-worth from your net worth? Because the problem is, if your self-worth is based on what's in your bank account and your bank account goes down, then you're having a really bad day. Yeah. You get depressed, you start making silly decisions so or bad decisions. So yeah. how, do you, how do you break that? How do you separate self-worth from net worth? I don't have an easy answer for that. That is really tough. And I struggled with that for a long time. And I think a lot of people do too. And especially if it hits you out of the blue, you know, let's say you've been successful your whole life, or like you said, you had a great job, all of a sudden you lose it. And now you're financially devastated, let's say, how do you separate those two out? I think us talking about it, that's the only thing that's going to change it. It's taking the stigma away, like we took it away for health, like we're taking it away for men's um, health issues, like we're taking it away for mental health. The only way we break that is by talking about it. And then as soon as you are like, oh, really, you're pretending to? Oh, really, you put Mm -hmm. your kid's private school on your line of credit because you actually really couldn't afford it? Oh, wow. So did I. Right? You know, or whatever. And and you start opening up. It's like, oh, wow. Other people like me 
are having struggles too. I think it's absolutely the only way. And then you really look at your life and you're just like, um, you know, what does financial freedom mean to you? And if you've been through tough times, um, you know, just being like, it's just not worth it. It's not worth to tie yourself up in that again. Yeah, no, I totally agree. You got to look forward. If things change and there's one guarantee, things are going to change. Uh-huh. That's just the way Whether it is. Whether we like it or not. Yep. So we have recency bias since we're doing a psychology show mm-hmm. here. And I assume that whatever happened yesterday will happen today. Right. Oh, it was a nice warm day out yesterday. I guess it'll be warm today. I don't need to bring my umbrella. Yeah, that's not actually how it works. It doesn't work that way at all. So I agree with you. Talk about it, learn about it, and and think forward. So how can people track you down? Where's the best way to follow what you're up to? Yeah. So um, you can visit me at kellykeen.com on Twitter. And so it's Kelly is spelled... K-E-L-L-E-Y. Right. K-E-E-H-N. But if you Google almost any variation of that, it'll it. pop up. There's a lot of K's and E's. And there's the a lot of K's it. and E's. There you yeah. go. Yeah. So kellykeen.com. Yes. And then Twitter? Twitter is Kelly Keen. Instagram and all those I think is Kelly Keen Biz. And then also is the um, Consumer Advocate for FP Canada. We have a... And they are the non-profit organization that uh, oversees certified financial planners in Canada. We have a great consumer site called um, financialplanningforcanadians.ca. And what kind of stuff is on that site? Almost everything you would want to know about personal finance. And most importantly, there's some videos and articles. If you are going to reach out to a financial pro, there's all the questions that you need to ask there. So please have a look at that. Um, It'll empower you. You can print them off Mm -hmm. and, and read them out to the person you're interviewing or you're with. And if anyone makes you feel uncomfortable, uh, that's time to move on and find someone else. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's fantastic because if you're prepared, I mean, just like buying a car. Well, I got five questions I need to ask. Yeah. Or booking a hotel room. Yeah. Right? Well, you know, we spend way more time on the holiday thing. Yeah. Anything like that. And the... um, because, of course, when you go to buy a car, it's, well, what's my monthly payment going to be? Yeah, no, that's not the first <laughs> question you should be asking. So you want to have the, the full question. So, 100%. Excellent. So there's lots of places to track you down. The book is called Talk Money to Me, available bookstores, Amazon, the whole bit, everywhere. So uh, it's, a, it's a great read. It's not... It's not complicated in that you're using a whole bunch of jargon. I think it's it's quite you know it's quite straightforward, but Thank it is you. packed with a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's because because let's face it, you and I both know that personal finance is. I mean, it's five words, right? Spend less than you make. That's yep. kind of that's it, right? There's yep. no there's nothing new in the world. But what you've done is you've you know as you said you know ten different concrete examples that will appeal to or be understandable for people at all different ages. So. If you're a little bit confused about how to think about that, well, you've walked them through it. So I think it's a it's a great read. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. I appreciate that. Kelly, thanks for being here. Pleasure. Always. That was Kelly Keen. Talk money to me. Uh, save well, spend some, and feel good about your money. So in bookstores everywhere. That's our show for today. Thanks for listening. Until next week, I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30. I'm going to throw it to I like it, you did a good job.